You know, there's a lot of misconceptions and lies about firearms, and that's the point of today's video, to tell you seven of those myths that are related to firearms and some of the components that go along with this, and hopefully give you some good information. Because unfortunately, a lot of people get their info either from social media or the mainstream media, and the truth lies somewhere in between those or well outside of those two atmospheres. So no matter if you're a gun person currently, or maybe you're just now getting into this, or maybe you're not a gun person at all, I can give you good information that you can use. So at least that way, you know what you're talking about going forward. And also if you hear something that's a straight up lie, that's one of these seven, you can say, okay, now I understand what that bearded guy on the internet was talking about. But if you like the content I do here, consider subscribing and hit your notifications. Let's go ahead and get started. You know, the first one I want to talk about is actual machine guns. They are legal, I believe, in 37 states for citizens to own, but there's a catch. So there's different classes of machine guns. Ronald Reagan was actually the one that imposed the 1986 ban on machine guns. So essentially, those pre-1986 guns are transferable, meaning you're an American citizen, you are a legal possessor of that firearm, and then basically you go through the same process that you would use to own a silencer. It's called a Form 4. Pay your tax stamp, and then you wait because they're going to run a series of background checks on you to make sure that you can be a lawful possessor. Problem with this, and transferables anyways, is the fact that they are super expensive. I was reading an article from the Armory Life and the guy that wrote this specific article said it cost him 600 bucks for a lower M16 receiver and now that piece would be, you know, 30 grand to replace it today. So they are very very expensive. Now you also have post 86 machine guns. Now these can be obtained by citizens, but that's where you have to have an FFL and an SOT. This will allow you to take possession of those guns and then you have like dealer transfer uh, pre-1986 machine guns as well. You know, so with extra taxes and background processes, you can actually go through and own a machine gun. These things are very, very little of them are actually used in crimes. Most of the time, it's the possessor that shouldn't be a possessor of those items is the only time they're really related to crimes at all. Same thing with silencers. A lot of people don't know that you can own a silencer. Now, if you've ever used a silencer, you, you kind of may chuckle at this because you're like, okay, I know that a, a silencer or suppressor will drop the decibels for the most part and depending upon the gun and round you're shooting, it will drop the decibels low enough where I can safely shoot without hearing protection. And this is the biggest reason that gun owners will buy these. You're talking about almost everyone from tactical shooters to people trying to defend their homes to hunters all love using suppressors because again, it makes it safe to use that gun inside of a home. I mean, just consider how loud an AR is at the range, open environment, outdoors. Now you condense that into a, you know, 2000 square foot home. That thing is, I mean, your ears are going to be ringing for days probably. And so this is why most people want to own a suppressor. It's simply to protect their hearing. And that's the truth behind it. And so next time you watch a Hollywood movie and they have guns in them and they attach suppressors and it basically sounds like nothing but a pew, you know, they're, there are some guns that actually are that quiet, but for the most part, you're going to hear a little bit more than that. It's just designed to keep the noise down to a safe level so you can shoot without hearing protection. And so those two can be obtained. Again, you go through a Form 4, you pay your $200 tax stamp, and then you just do a bunch of waiting. That's basically the hardest part about suppressors. Next thing I want to talk about is how dumb the gun laws are in America. So I'm going to use this dry bog here as my example. And you may think you know where I'm going with this. Maybe you're right. Who knows? But this is the dry bog and this is a pistol. So when I buy this and I go through my 4473, which is my background check, this is going to be labeled as a pistol. It has under 16 inch barrel. Okay. This is actually a pistol brace. Now, 
the ATF said for over a decade that these things were fine. And earlier this year, there was a, a lot of uproar about these things. You know, they were going to make everybody that owned these register them or destroy them and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyways, a, uh, you know, after injunctions from GOA and FPC, uh, finally, a federal judge said, hey, you can't impose that ruling. It is unconstitutional. But this is a pistol brace, and this was designed to help people with disabilities. The ATF also said that if you if you actually shoulder this thing, then you know you're fine. It's not designed to be a stock. It's not really comfortable or anything like that. It actually has the Velcro on there. Okay, so whatever. But if I were to take a traditional stock and put it on here, that looks very similar to this. Now I'm a felon. Now I could serve 10 years in prison for actually doing that. Now, even more erroneous, if I add this angled foregrip to that same pistol y'all just saw, no problem at all. But if I add this vertical grip to that same pistol, you've just earned yourself a felony. Now you may be asking, what the heck is the difference? They're both used to stabilize the gun. Well, there's really only one difference. You know, it's the way you hold it. You know, an angled foregrip, it's gonna be more like, I don't know, this. This one is gonna be more like this, you know, I mean, maybe like this, there's literally no difference except for the way they look and a little bit of functionality, but they're both designed to do the same thing. And that's to stabilize the gun. Those are the gun laws that when you hear gun people talk about how just dumb they are, and that's just one or two examples, we could go on and on. I could make an entire video about dumb gun laws in America. Heck, I think I just gave myself another video idea, so make sure you subscribe for that because it really makes no sense whatsoever. Because remember, things like this actually make a more stable gun. A more stable gun is a safer gun for everyone. Next thing I wanna talk about is magazines and clips. Now, this is a magazine, this is a clip. Two very different things. And you may be saying, well, what does that really matter if I interchange magazine and clip? Well, it's almost like you're misgendering the magazine if you call it a clip, and you're misgendering the clip if you call it a magazine. They are two totally different things. So the way this is designed to work, not in this exact uh, gun or in this exact magazine, but typically a clip, like a stripper clip, will hold a series of rounds, five or 10 rounds, sometimes more. And what this does, again, it doesn't work with this magazine, but it is designed to go in like an internal box magazine. Think about something like the SKS. It's got an internal box magazine. So when I go to load it, again, it's not for this gun, by the way, but you'll get the idea. I have rounds that are attached to this. I can slide this down in there. I can then pull it out. And now I have loaded my internal magazine, right? And so that's the biggest difference. It was just knowing the, the proper nomenclature. It's like uh, almost in every other facet of life, well, some people give you a hard time for interchanging, you know, some words for other things, yes. But when it comes to firearms, these things are really important to know. If you're at the range and your buddy says, hey, hand me that stripper clip and, you know, you're reaching for a, a, an AR magazine or something, you know, that's something you should probably know. You know, in firearms specifically, you want to know the names of some of the parts, right? You know that this is a stock and this is a trigger and this is a bolt. And so just knowing some of those basic things will help you not only if you ever go to the range or you're an avid range goer or hunter or self-defense or trainer or whatever, but also being able to pass that information down to somebody else and not sound like you're getting your information from a freaking rap song. I have jokingly had this conversation with more friends than I would like to admit uh, because they know me as the, you know, like the magazine guy, like don't say clip around headshot, you know, that kind of thing. Like I said, it's done in good humor. It's not like I get totally pissed when somebody saw, calls a magazine a clip, you know, because at the end of the day, that's on them, not on me. But, you know, we more joke about it than anything. Some of my friends will say clip because they know it's a magazine and, you know, just try to get under my skin or whatever. But at the end of the day, I've been able to teach more people about this 
Uh, and, and that kind of makes me happy because people now know, at least in my inner circle, like, hey, that actually is a magazine and there's a clip and they are two totally different things. And so that's why it matters. When you're talking about something, you should know what you're talking about and at least have some information on it. No matter how you feel about firearms, at least if you have the right information, you can make a valid opinion on it. And again, you can have a valid opinion on anything. It's like, you know, if you want to talk about anything, you don't have to be a woman to talk about a woman, or you don't have to be a man to talk about a man. You just have to have a functioning brain and some information to go along with that to back up your case. Same thing with firearms. At least learn the things that you're talking about. Even if you're, if you're totally against me owning these things, at least know what you're talking about before you get into a conversation trying to act like you know what you're talking about. That's why these things really matter. Another example. Now, assault weapon was actually used first in Nazi Germany to describe the Sturmgewehr, the STG-44. And so that is the first assault weapon ever used. You know, it was kind of the basis for a, a lot of guns that would follow after World War II. And the U.S. Army has a definition of what an assault rifle or assault weapon actually is. It's a compact weapon that has the ability to select fire. So it could be full auto, it could be switched to burst, it could be switched to semi-auto, but it has the ability to switch between all of those. But it also fires an intermediate cartridge. So somewhere between, let's say, the MP40 and the Car 98K, that's where the Sturmgewehr fell in line. So an intermediate cartridge that's fast moving, it's gonna be way more effective than a nine millimeter sub gun, but it's not gonna be as effective, especially at distance, as a full powder cartridge like the eight millimeter Mauser. That's what an assault rifle actually is. So you may be thinking, okay, well, what does that matter? Well, in the eighties, this term was coined from anti-gun lobbyists. And so they use that to describe something like this. Well, you may be thinking, well, that's a pretty compact gun. That's an assault weapon. No, this is semi-auto only. So on my safety selector, I have safety and I have fire and fire is only semi-auto. The reason this matters is because assault weapon is used to, to kind of throw around in the media to scare people into gun legislation. Because as a gun person, or maybe somebody that isn't so familiar, you hear assault rifle and that sounds really scary. You, you think to yourself, okay, those things definitely need to be taken away because nobody needs an assault rifle. Not realizing that the basis for this gun is the same for every single pistol on the market. You fire one round, one bullet comes out, you reset the trigger, you fire another round. That is literally how almost every modern gun out there works besides, you know, uh, bolt action rifles essentially. That and pump action shotguns, you know, stuff like that. There are exceptions, but for the most part, one round, one trigger pull, that is literally a semi-auto gun, and they are nowhere close to an actual assault rifle at all. Now, since we are on the topic of so-called assault weapons, I wanted to bring the AR into the conversation because this is America's rifle. This is the most commonly used rifle in America. And just like the gun I just showed you, it's the same principle. I have a safety and I have fire. And with each trigger pull, I have one round that comes out. Now, you may be thinking, okay, well, that makes sense, but this gun is used in the majority of mass shootings. That's why people want to actually ban it. Well, statistically, if I told you this gun is used way less than handguns in crimes, would that be surprising to you? And when I say way less, I mean way less. I mean, up to 50% of homicides in the United States are used with a pistol. Less than 3% are used with not just this rifle or this kind of rifle, but every rifle. As a matter of fact, according to some statistics, I think I read one from 2019, but people use their fist in homicides more than they use any kind of rifle. They use knives more than they use fists and they use knives way more often than any kind of rifle. Why does this matter? Well, because every time you hear a gun control advocate speak, they're talking about the AR-15 or rifles like this. 
Now you may be thinking, well, if they're used in such a small amount of crimes, why would they want to take these away and not pistols? And that's exactly the point. Even though these are the most common rifles in America, they're also the scariest. They are the ones that can be demonized more often than any other. It's really hard to demonize a pistol. You know, a pistol is a, is a pistol. You know, there's a bunch of different types, but it's harder to demonize a pistol than it is something that looks like this. And you can also use terms like assault weapon to describe this, and that will kind of maybe put people in your corner that don't know anything about it. Then there's the other side of it. If they can get away with actually getting rid of these and banning these, then pistols are not far to follow. Because if you were to ban these today, considering there's like over 100 million of these things, and that's just an estimate, in the country, it would literally have no impact to the amount of shootings and, and deaths that we see in the country. They could easily go back and say, okay, that didn't have the impact that we had intended. Now it's time to look at pistols and down the rabbit hole you go. So that's why you see so much pushback and hesitation from people that are gun owners when they hear about any legislation that includes these or any gun for that matter, but especially these because this is their easier gateway in order to eliminate guns altogether. And then once you actually factor in how many of those shootings are gang related, well, you start to get a little bit different of a picture that's painted, but those are the facts. Next thing I want to talk about is concealed carry. Now I've covered a lot of concealed carry, you know, guns, comparisons, holsters, gun belts on my channel. I believe it's something that, you know, everybody should practice as law abiding citizens because it gives you an option when there are no other options, right? If it comes between you and your family and you have the right to protect yourself, I say utilize that right. And concealed carry is a great way to do that. But a lot of people actually correlate concealed carry with criminals. But there's one big difference. You know, there are constitutional carry states, and I am all about that. I, I support that 100%. But there's also states that make you go through a training class in order to conceal carry. The bigger part of this is most concealed carriers actually take the time to invest into concealed carry as a whole. So they will actually take the time to buy a proper holster for that gun, buy a proper gun belt, train with it, practice at the range, use situational awareness, and they could also be somebody that could potentially save your life in a situation, whether you're in a gas station or grocery store or somewhere else, they are literally all around you and you have no idea. And that is the beautiful thing about concealed carry. They may protect you from that same criminal that you're so afraid of. And that's what we do whenever we decide that we're going to carry a gun. We not only carry that gun for our safety and the safety of our families, but for other people around us that could potentially be harmed by a criminal. And so no, concealed carry is not a criminal thing. It's actually something that more law-abiding citizens, you know, utilize more than you probably think. And it is a beautiful thing that we have in this country, the right to self-preservation. And a lot of us will utilize that right if we have to. Last thing I want to talk about is this gun and this gun. Now, if you don't know anything about guns and you looked at this gun and this gun, which one do you think is easier to shoot? A lot of people may say this gun, but it's actually harder to shoot. And so I want to kind of dispel the misconception that small guns are for, you know, new shooters or they're for females only. Now, a lot of men will actually utilize this small gun, but that's after they've practiced and trained typically with a bigger gun. And the reason this is easier to shoot is because it has more mass. So more weight, more mass, less spell recoil, and that's why these guns are easier to shoot. So if you're going to, I don't know, try to help your wife pick out her first gun or something like that, or you're a woman and you're going to buy your first gun, there's all the pretty guns. I did a video on this not too long ago. All the pretty guns and the colorful guns and all of that kind of stuff got to be really careful about which ones you pick though because if you're going to carry this 
you need to be able to shoot it and to be able to shoot it effectively is going to take a lot more practice than if you started with something bigger that you can actually learn on. Now, I'm not trying to dissuade anybody from concealed carry. I want men and women alike to conceal carry, but it is much harder to learn on something like this. So again, if you're going to buy your first gun, whether you're a female or a guy or whatever, if you're just now learning, heck, I could have used this uh, information when I first started too, to be honest with you, the, the smaller the gun, typically the harder it is to shoot, the bigger the gun, it's gonna be easier to learn this skill. And so those are seven misconceptions about guns in the United States. And so I'd love to hear some from y'all. If you have your own list of seven or you wanna drop one or two, leave those things down below. And if you like what I do, consider subscribing. You can also support us on Patreon or right here on the channel and never have to leave YouTube. Big thanks to you guys. See you in the next one. And as always, hold them down.